Whether you're a skeptic or a believer, join me, Rob McConnell, as together we'll investigate the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology here on the Exxon Radio TV show on XZBN and the Exxon TV channel on Simul TV. Since 1990, the Exxon Radio TV show has been the place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. Together, we'll investigate UFOs, aliens, ghosts, Bigfoot, psychic phenomena, lake monsters, conspiracy theories, government cover-ups, the truth embargo, alien abductions, ESP, haunted locations from around the world, and so much more. With over 28 years of broadcasting and more than 4,500 individual guests, the Exxon is truly a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality, as evidenced by the credibility, integrity, and professionalism of the guests that we bring to our international audience. If you have seen a UFO, had a close encounter, seen a ghost, Bigfoot, lake monster, or a story that you would like to share or have investigated, contact me, Rob McConnell, by sending me your email to xzone at xzoneradiotv.com or you can call toll-free 1-800-610-7035, extension 143, and on Skype, Exxon Radio TV. For more information on the Exxon Radio TV show with yours truly, Rob McConnell, visit www.exxoneradiotv.com or www.exxonetvchannel.com or simultv.com and xzbn.net. Until next we meet here in the X-Zone from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Always remember X-Zone Nation. Keep your eyes to the sky and your heart in the light. This This is is A Different different Perspective perspective with Kevin Kevin Randall. Randall. A retired U.S. Lieutenant Colonel, Kevin Randall has been studying UFOs for nearly 50 years. Kevin has investigated some of the most famous UFO cases in the world and has been consulted for dozens of documentaries about UFOs. Considered one of the leading experts into the Roswell UFO crash of 1947, Kevin has written more than 25 books about UFOs, including the recently published Roswell in the 21st century. Now, here is the host of A Different Perspective, Kevin Randall. And the introduction was correct. This is A Different Perspective, and I am Kevin Randall. But I'm thinking about having the introduction changed because it makes me sound so old. In fact, it was 50 years ago this month, May of 1969, that I actually blew up a helicopter in Vietnam on a landmine, which is a whole different story. Uh, Those of you who are interested in verifying this claim, go to 187th AHC and look at the unit history. And in May of 1969, you'll see the notation about me blowing up the helicopter on a landmine. I just thought I'd mention it because it was 50 years ago this month. Um, also, I wanted to mention that, uh, as, as I've said in the past, Rob McConnell has initiated the International UFO Reporting Research Center, the IUFORCC, and you can find it at www.iufoRRC.com. And it's for those of you who've had a sighting or that sort of thing, and there's a reporting form for you to take a look at. The, the idea is to investigate the UFO sightings with an eye to gathering a proper database rather than confirming a belief structure. And I, I just always like to mention that there are other fine programs that you can find that deal with the paranormal at xzbn.net. And the one final thing I wanted to say is um, a couple of people said I mentioned my own books too often during the program and promoting them. So for this program, I'm not going to mention my books, which would include the uh, Roswell in the 21st Century, Encounter in the Desert about Socorro, Case MJ-12, which deals obviously with MJ-12, Crash When UFOs Fall from the Sky, Government UFO Files, UFO Dossier, and a host of others. I'm just not going to mention those this time. I am joined by Jerry Clark. He is the author of the UFO Encyclopedia. Volume 3 came out uh, several months ago, and those of us who study UFOs, this is a resource that we absolutely have to have. It is a comprehensive view of the UFO field 
starting from the beginning when we didn't even know there was a UFO field. Jerry has studied the UFO phenomena for decades and has written a number of books about them, including Unnatural Phenomena and Hidden Realms, Lost Civilizations and Beings from Other Worlds. He edited Fate and the International UFO Reporter, which was the official publication of QFOS. He served on the board for QFOS for 20 years, and like so many other writers, his work has appeared in many magazines, and I'll mention uh, just Omni and Wired. Omni, the new people may not know that it was a... um, sort of a science fiction magazine from the 1990s, and Wired is a current publication. Like so many others in the UFO field, he has a wide variety of interests, which I bring up because people seem to think we just focus on UFOs when we do many other things. He uh, reviews current music uh, on the Roots Music Recordings, uh, posted regularly at rambles.net. Yeah, I kind of botched that, didn't I? He has written songs with Robin and Linda Williams and that have been recorded by various artists, including Emily Emmy Lou Harris and Tom T. Hall. He has many interests, including politics, history, literature, cats, and craft beer. He lives in Minnesota, and I'm not going to ask him about politics because that could be deadly. Um, welcome, Jerry Clark. Well, good to be here, Kevin. Thanks for having me. Well, you know, it's it's a good way to um, get a chance to chat with friends without having to spend any money. <laughs> Which, of course, uh, again, people won't understand. We used to have to pay for long-distance calls, and now with uh, the Internet and everything, we don't have to do that. Uh, before we get started and too deep into this, and I, I, one thing I want to say is you are the first person I've invited on the show who's had so many questions asked uh, to my blog to p- put to you uh, since I started doing that. And so that's kind of kind of an honor for you. But before we get into the, any of that um, – as most of you know, or maybe you, maybe you don't, Stan Friedman passed away on Monday, I guess it was. The story I hear now is that he had just given a lecture in Ohio and had returned to the airport to return home and uh, had some kind of a seizure and passed away at the airport, which I think is kind of sad when you think about it, being run by strangers that way. Uh, Jerry, you knew Stan for many, many years. Yes, I did. Uh... I understand that, you know, there's a kind of other way of looking at the circumstances of his death, and that's he was doing what he wanted to do on the road, talking about UFOs. And there's something to be said for dying in your bed surrounded by family, but there's also something to be said for dying when you're doing what you love best. And Stan was just tireless. In fact, I was shocked that he was still lecturing when I heard how he died. Because I thought he'd retired in a few months ago. Well, he had he had retired. He said he retired, but he was going to show up at the um, the festival in Roswell here coming up in July. Um, mm. And then they made a comment, well, so much for retirement. So apparently he hadn't completely retired. Yeah, well, it's kind of hard to give up old habits. Well, I, I just sometimes wonder if you do the complete retirement thing and you're sitting around the house – and you don't have anything else to do. You're sitting around the house. You don't have a job. You don't um, go out anymore. Uh, if that isn't just kind of waiting for the Grim Reaper type of thing. So being out there engaged in what you're doing may help keep you alive longer than it than it would if you just sat around. Well, I never saw any evidence that Stan had any other interest in UFOs. Yes, but he was out chasing them. So as you yeah. said, he was doing what he wanted to do. Yeah. Uh, I uh, I first met Stan probably right after we got into the Roswell investigation, which I blame you and QFOS for, by the way. Thanks. <laughs> well, I was I was minding my own business, and and Don Schmidt called and wanted to know if I wanted to participate in this investigation of Roswell on it because I've my military background, and I said yes, not realizing what I was getting myself into. Yeah. Uh, and and the funny thing, you know, is Stan. Uh, Stan learned that I had managed to sell a book to Avon, and he he said, well, you know, um, you should put my name on the book in the third position and send a, send me a quarter of the money. And I'm thinking, why? So, uh, you know, he, he was, uh, you know, the person that Stan reminded me the most of was Phil Class. <laughs> yes, I, I see that. Yeah, they held, of course, exactly opposite opinions about UFOs, but they had the same personality, and they were relentless and stubborn, and you couldn't, you, they never admitted to error, ever. <laughs> so 
So they went to the grave in the, in their own minds, at least, never having been wrong about anything. <laughs> well, I know Stan investigated my background to make sure that what I was saying about my military experience was true, and I never heard a peep out of him about it, so he must have verified it to his satisfaction. Well, I remember, you know, I my few contacts with him in, in the last decade or so have been occasionally where he would pop into my life to argue something that I just thought was really not credible, untenable, inadequately documented. Everything from, you know, crash saucer stories to MJ-12. And I would try to explain to him as someone who, I'm not a professional historian except of the UFO controversy perhaps, but most of what I read is history. I love history. I've loved history since I was a little kid. And I have I've read a lot of historical controversies, you know, about did this happen or didn't this happen or why did this happen or why didn't it happen. And I have a keen appreciation of the way historians who get involved in those debates marshal evidence. And they're not going to put themselves out unless they think the evidence is really good. And uh, Stan fancied himself a historian, apparently, particularly when he was writing his MJ-12 books, but the evidence that he was using to advance this really extraordinary claim was really, would convince no one who had any historical sophistication. And I would try to explain that to him, but he just, he just couldn't understand it. And it was sort of his view that if he had it in his head, it was there because it was true. And, uh, argument over. But on the other hand, you give him credit for, if you can question his judgment, there was no question about his courage. You know, he took on an unpopular cause and, and fought hard for it and fearlessly. Oh, he was tenacious in following up on leads and uh, finding witnesses and interviewing witnesses and uh, uh, searching for documentation. He was absolutely relentless in that. And yet at the same time, he was, as you well know, probably better than anybody, he was shaping the narrative, you know, to, to suit his ideas about what, you know, the data meant. Even when the data were questionable or susceptible to an entirely different interpretation. But to be fair, I mean, a lot of people writing about UFOs do the same thing. Uh, oh, really? <laughs> I've never heard of that. <laughs> yeah, well, no. there, go, there you go. go. My, my, my punditry shows through there, I guess. Uh, <laughs> no, th th of course that's true. But I think that Stan, who is, you know, more visible than almost anybody in this field, you know, he was a major player. And so, and he, he, was in he was in the middle of some major controversies which you know which erupted in the 80s and 90s and now I see mostly re well, resolved I, I don't I, I'm going to I'm going to have to interrupt you here because we're going to have to take a break and I hate to do it cuz you were on a roll and I I appreciated your role uh, my obituary for Stan is up at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com and once again uh, there's some other fine programs that deal with the paranormal on the X Zone broadcast network I am joined by Jerry Clark here. We will return in just a moment with more, a little more about Stan Friedman, and then we'll get into some of the stuff that Jerry's interested in. So please stick around. It's hard to listen to the news without realizing we're living in volatile, unprecedented times. Yet never has there been such an opportunity to transform the human condition. As old structures fail, where can we find the guidance to co-create a better way? Find Your Path Home is an ever-evolving, leading-edge information, education, and healing resource center designed to support and guide you on your path to unity and enlightenment. Based on sound principles employed by Shaman Worldwide, we provide techniques that can support you through the current transitions, offering online shamanic classes, 
international long-distance Shamana healing sessions, complimentary Mission Evolution radio episodes and Stairway to Heaven TV vignettes, seminars, retreats, and much more. All of this can be found on findyourpathhome.com. So I was watching the X-Zone TV channel last night when I was abducted by aliens and they kept repeating to me over and over again, simultv.com, simultv.com. What's simultv.com? That's what I asked them. They had it written on the side of their UFO. How do you spell that? UFO. No, I mean simultv.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Right. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Interesting that you were abducted by aliens in a simultv.com UFO last night. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Now that you mention it, I remember now last night I was awakened from a deep sleep. My great-grandmother was standing there. She said she'd come from the hereafter to tell me about simultv.com. She even spelled it out for me. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com, sonny boy. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com, sonny boy. Wow. Yeah. Guys, you'll never guess what my psychic guru just told me. SIMULTV.com. Exactly. Are you guys psychic too? Of course. We all know about SIMULTV.com. SIMULTV.com. I am joined by Jerry Clark. He's the author of the UFO Encyclopedia, Volume 3, which is a massive compendium of uh, UFO lore. From the very beginnings to the contactees to abductions to practically anything you want to know about UFOs, it's there. Uh, wonder, wonderful resource book. You were saying, Jerry, before I so rudely interrupted you for the commercial break uh, about Stan. I think that, you know, uh, since I've written a number of those of us who have been around have all written uh, obituaries for colleagues who passed on. And when you do that, you try to assess their legacy, how they're going to be seen in the in the broader history of the UFO controversy. And I think that Stan will be credited and admired as a tireless, fearless advocate. I think that on other things, he'll be seen as being on the wrong side of some significant issues that he should have known better than to, you know, position himself the way he did, and I mean, of course, MJ-12 and all these, the Aztec crash and all these really dubious stories that began to circulate, and Stan seemed to, in some ways, to have lost his his critical filter about some things. Well, yeah, I was going to mention the, the Aztec thing as well. Um, I'm just stunned that uh, he would climb on board that uh, crash yeah. UFO. But uh, I, we all make mistakes in the field as well, as you as you know. I'm I'm uh, guilty of the Frank Kaufman boondoggle, so uh, I can understand how these things come about. Well, all of us make mistakes, but it's how we handle them. And I don't think Stan ever changed his mind about anything. And I know that you and I, whatever our other undoubted faults, have changed our minds, have admitted that we were wrong about something or the. We could have thought something else through more fully than we did initially. Yeah, I was going to say and follow I, follow through on the investigation. You know, get the information you want and then quit. Ask this follow up question. Exactly. Which I think frequently isn't done in the UFO field. Well, but probably let's, many fields. <laughs> but let's move on because we're becoming too somber and and serious, and I I just don't like to be serious too much. Um. Well, let's talk about a little bit about the uh, UFO Encyclopedia Volume Three. Um, tell me, tell me a little bit about that, and c- c- to kind of get us started here. Well, it's two volumes and total fourteen uh, one thousand four hundred sixty-two pages, including bibliography and index, and it weighs a lot, and the print is small, so you're getting. Be sure that you're. If you're having back problems, maybe you should have someone else pick up your copies when they arrive in the mail. It's well, let me let me, let, let me interrupt because one thing that I find the most valuable part of the resource is, in fact, the sources that you cite. So you'll have an article about a specific topic, and there'll be a long list of sources that it, that you drew from to, to come to your conclusions on that. And I think that's a very valuable resource for anybody to have so we can go back and look at the source and see where things came from. Well, thank you for saying that. I'm really proud of that part of the book, to, to, to show where you go to find out more. By now, as you well know, 
there's an immense literature on UFOs. And if you're interested and you want to find out something, perhaps the encyclopedia is a place to start because it'll you can follow the story as it evolved in the UFO literature over the years. One of the things I've noticed um, in reading some of the recent books that have been sent is that the authors seem to have a very superficial knowledge of the field. Yes. And they don't go into research. I started something called Chasing Footnotes, where I'd look at a footnote and try to get back to the original source to see what the real story was. And I, and I just think too often these people doing some of these newer books just don't follow the uh, the bouncing ball. They don't chase the footnotes. They don't chase the sources to get to the bottom line of the story. There's also a, a lot of glibness about the UFO field itself, even within the field by people who ought to know better. The, the UFO study, UFO enthusiasm, whatever you want to call it, you know, it's, it has a rich history of its own. And generally, people want to believe that all people who are serious interested in UFOs are this or that. But in fact, the story of ufology is really the story of the ufologies because there are all kinds of different people who've participated in it, and they've and there have been many very different ideas and approaches and and levels of serious and rational thinking versus, you know, credulity and true belief. And it's a human story that doesn't get told, and I believe that it is told in the encyclopedia. And that was one of the things that when I started the whole project in 1989, when I was working on the, started working on the first edition, the first volume, was that I want to tell this human story and show these aren't a bunch of nutballs, and that these were many of these people were serious and intelligent and did the best within their own limitations. And one thing that the ufologists did for all their faults, they preserved the data, which hardly anybody else was looking at. They recorded the sightings, they investigated the sightings, they tried to make sense of them while everybody else was just ridiculing the subject or, or mishandling it, as, as Blue Book did. And well, one day in the history of human knowledge, ufologists will get credit for being ahead of the other knowledge preservers and collectors. Well, I think one of the things that's interesting is, um, you, you know, looking at this, we have the field of, uh, I guess, the phenomenon of the contactee, as opposed to the abductee. Um, mm. Sort of the same kind of things, but in a different uh, perspective, if you will, um, and in a different level of credibility. Uh, the contactees were uh, people who rode on the saucers to Venus and Mars, and the abductees were kind of dragged, kicking and screaming into them. Um, what, that, what do you, that... what do, I was going to say, what do, you, what do you think of all of that? Well, I think you made a good point. One thing that differentiates, say, um, George Adamski from some con some abductee who was, had this encounter with something that shocked and frightened him is high strangeness. This is not very often thought about, but it is crucial to the difference between abductees and contactees. You read a book by Adamski, and you know that this is story is being made up by a guy without a great imagination. You read an abductee's testimony, and you're reading something that is really weird. It's it's in in the area of high strangeness. It's stuff that, well, I suppose that somebody could invent it, but it is really shocking and unexpected and complex in ways that you couldn't anticipate. And the abductee testimony has the resonance of real experience, whatever that experience is, however defined, it's, it's a real and kind of unearthly encounter. Whereas the classic contactees of the 50s and 60s were just making it up, and that's not hard to figure out because their stories just simply lack that kind of otherworldly resonance. Well, the one thing I know is I interviewed Carol Wayne Watts back in the late 1960s, and he was a guy in Texas who claimed to be abducted. And looking at it, 
about how they had all these paper maps scattered around and all these documents laying around. And I'm thinking, um, why? Didn't didn't perceive then, and of course nobody really thought of it at that time. You would be you would be doing that digitally. Uh, we have great digital resources. We don't need a paper map to look at something now. We have the digital resources to do it. And his, as you said, it just wasn't a very imaginative tale that he told. And I, I, I think that uh, you you take a look at that, and you realize that you know Adamski was, I think, going to Venus. Um, didn't account for the temperatures on the surface of Venus when he told his tales. So, yeah. uh, the, the other thing I noticed is they never they never really argued with one another. The contactees, it, they would say things like uh, Van Tassel, who I think went to Mars, would say, "Well, you can't believe those Venusians," and Adamski would say, "You got to be careful with those Martians." And it was kind of a, uh, I guess, a sideline shot at the at his opposition in there. But they never really attacked one another the way we sometimes do in ufology. In the November 1957 issue of the science fiction magazine Fantastic Universe, the great ufologist Isabel Davis wrote a, wrote a piece which is, I think, one of the classic pieces of writing in ufology. It's called Meet the Extraterrestrial. And she reviewed about a half a dozen major contactee books that had been published up to the mid-1950s. And one of the things that she does is prove by judicious use of quotes that their the contactees respective cosmologies were utterly incompa- incompatible <laughs> that they were each contactee had his own universe and it was different from the universe of the the contactee down the street well that, that was kind of what I, I I noticed as well they didn't really kind of attack one another but they're they made they they, they took these sideline shots at one another. Um, when we come back here in just a moment, I, I, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the airships uh, from 1897, 1896, 1897, because I know we kind of differ on our opinion on there. And I thought we'd we'd touch on that because it might be uh, interesting to do that. Um, I'm here with Jerry Clark. His book is the UFO Encyclopedia, Volume Three. It's a wonderful resource for those of you who are interested in the phenomenon. If you're looking for more information about um, uh, Stan Friedman and that sort of thing, uh, take a look at the, the comments on uh, at my blog at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. I have an obituary. Talked a little bit about. Uh, my experiences with Stan Friedman and that sort of thing. And like I say, you know, there's uh, many fine programs that deal with the paranormal on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, xzbn.net. Take a look at the um, hosts and see if there's something that uh, really trips your trigger. I will be back right after this with Jerry Clark. They are here, and they've been here for thousands of years, making their presence known in the shadows. They might be seen by a lonely motorist on a deserted road late at night, or by a frightened and confused husband in the bedroom he is sharing with his wife. But who are they? What do they want? Why are they here? Perhaps most concerning, has the government been aware of their presence all along? The new book by Ellie Marzulli, UFO Disclosure, The 70-Year Cover-Up Exposed, delves into the world of UFOs. Can full disclosure be soon? Order now and receive a free hour and 37-minute DVD on the UFO phenomenon, UFOs Are Real. Get both the book and the DVD, a $40 value, for only $19.99. To order your book and DVD today, go to lamarzuli.net. That's L-A-M-A-R-Z-U-L-L-I dot net. Rob McConnell here, presenting an overview for Nicholas Paul Jinnix, author of a fascinating book, Amen. It presents facts revealed by Egyptologists, facts that enable us to understand why Amen is the beginning of creation of God. It provides recommendations for religious leaders of the major religions to unify their beliefs and teach the word of God, love one another. Amen informs people how mankind conceived God. It was the Egyptians that developed the concepts of a soul, a hereafter, and son of God, and finally, 
After the worship of many gods, they conceived the belief in one universal God, the maker of all there is. For more information, visit www.futureofgodamen.com. That's www.futureofgodamen.com. You have heard of the X Zone? Now watch it on Simo TV, plus 500 video games, live TV channels, free video on demand, worldwide, and more. Does this sound like tomorrow's television? Well, it is, but you can have it today, right now. It is Simo TV. Simo TV offers what the others only wish they could provide 15 exclusive channels like X Zone, Sci Fi, and Horror. We are worldwide. No other provider offers that. 500 built in video games. No need to have an extra expensive system. We have them included. Free video on demand. Live streaming events from around the world. Interactive online network and much more. Tomorrow's TV today. Simul TV. Sound too good to be true? Well, it's not. You can have Simul TV today. Sign up at simultv.com. Do it today. I am here with Jerry Clark, he of the UFO Encyclopedia, Volume 3. Uh, when we left, I was going to mention, mention uh, something about the airships and Jerry and I's, uh, I guess, conflict on that, the manner conflict though it be. Uh, but there's questions that have been sent to me uh, to ask you, Jerry, and I thought maybe we ought to get to those before I run out of time. Uh, first, I noticed um, what well, one of the uh, commentators said in, the, I guess, Volume 2 of your encyclopedia, you didn't do much with the Rendlesham Forest, the Bent, Bentwaters case of the uh, uh, events with Charles Holt and those people. And in the new volume, I don't see anything at all about it. What, what's your take on the Rendlesham Forest? Oh, boy. This is the second time I've asked this question last, been asked this question last week. What <laughs> happened was that I had a very short deadline on the third edition of the encyclopedia. It, it really would have taken about a year to do it the way I wanted to, and we got about half that time. So I was working 10, 12 hours a day. And I want to insert right now that that among the people who helped me and made really good guest contributions to the book were Brad Sparks and Tom Tulin and Bill Chalker and Eddie Bullard and, and Tiago Tichetti from Brazil. I want to mention them. They're in the book, and they'd had some wonderful pieces of writing in the book. But anyway, so there were, th- there were all kinds of things that I wanted to do that I wasn't able to do just because there was no time. And I realized that, as we know, the Rendlesham case is a huge mess. And just about everybody has a different story about what happened. And I realized that the version that I used in this second edition of the encyclopedia was outdated, to say the least. Now, if I'd had the extra months to work on the book, I would have sat down with all the literature and all the claims and counterclaims by proponents and debunkers and witnesses and so on, and try to construct some kind of narrative and make some judgments about what's credible and what wasn't. But that was one of the things that I couldn't do because there was no time. I did not want to recycle the version that appears in the second edition because I say that's obsolete. And so I finally decided that I just was going to drop the entire encyclo- the entire Rendlesham case because I couldn't deal with it adequately and I didn't want bad or misleading or outdated information in the encyclopedia. Well, yeah, I understand that completely. As I was working on one of the one of the books I had written, um, I was going to do the uh, Willingham crash saucer just across the uh, border near Del Rio, Texas, and from from that. And uh, we had that affidavit that he had supplied, I think, to the Center for UFO Studies, uh, where he made all these claims about it. And I thought, well, I'll I'll see what's new in that. And in doing that, I discovered there was all these discrepancies, that the timing had changed, that the number of craft had changed, all of these things. I was able to find the first version of the story he told in Skylook, which was the forerunner to the MUFON journal, um, where he told a completely different story. And I think everybody 
assign great credibility to that story, the Willingham story of finding the crash saucer, because he claimed to have been a colonel in the Air Force, a fighter pilot. And looking at that, I got pictures of him in his Air Force uniforms, and I got to looking at him and, and realized these are CAP uniforms. It's not Civil Air, it's Civil Air Patrol, it's not the Air Force. And, yeah. and so people say, well, he was in an Air Force uniform at you know, in the 1960s, I look, you could see on the collar, it said CAP, not uh, not the rank insignia. So, I mean, I, I had to alter that completely. So I understand that what we believed 15, 20 years ago is now completely different because we have much better information. And I imagine you ran across that quite a bit in putting together the encyclopedia. Yeah, I, that, absolutely. We know so much more than we did then, and particularly – from my point of view, because I've always been fascinated with the pre-Arnold history of the UFO phenomenon. And these days we have so much more information on that because we have access to you know, archives and old newspapers, whole runs of old newspapers. And we just know an enormous amount more than we used to. And, uh, and, that, and if you're paying attention to that stuff, it is going to alter your understanding and it's it's going to shape your understanding of you know what was what was happening before before the Arnold side. Well, one of the questions that came in, you know, multi-part, it has has Jerry ever changed his mind in either direction for or against well-known significant UFO cases? And one of the things that this uh, person wrote was, uh, what about the airships? I know. Um, I believe that the I, – I don't believe there was a good core of, of, of sightings to the airship. I think you believe that there was a solid core in 1896 that kind of led to the mushrooming of all the nonsensical stories we saw in 1897. Um, no, that's not actually my view. Um, okay. <laughs> um, it, first of all, you can't discuss the airship phenomenon without acknowledging that it was an international phenomenon that began in the middle of the uh, 19th century and went into the probably the first two or three decades of the 20th century. It was much more widespread than, um, than we, we used to know. And um, so much of the criticism of the airship phenomenon by people who want to dismiss it entirely really is an artifact of the reporting process. The artifact is the journalistic standards of the American press, particularly the provincial press, in, the, in 1897. So you get a lot of stories. Some stories you get that really seem credible and that sometimes were written by the person who saw the airship. And so, so that's firsthand testimony. But you also get a lot of hoaxes and jokes. Sometimes the hoaxes are perpetrated by, you know, people out in some small town or, you know, some local jokester. Sometimes the stories were invented in the newspaper offices, I think, for the, you know, to fill the columns and to entertain the readers, most of whom probably recognize it. Oh, yeah, this is a, this is a jokey story. This is satire. But the deeper you dig into this, and when you also get an understanding of the international dimensions of this phenomenon, which was described pretty much the same wherever it was encountered, which was in many different countries, you have to appreciate that as impenetrably strange as the airship phenomenon was, it was real. It was experienced. It wasn't just a bunch of jokes and mistakes. It was a real phenomenon. And and some of the stories are just, even some of the mind-bogglingly strange stories, like where people said that they had the eight, the airship equivalent of the C-3, where people claimed they had met the occupants of the ships. Those stories, some of them are actually documentable. I investigated one, and I was just stunned to find out that to, that it was actually a multi-witness case. You, 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 there, there was information about the witnesses, one of whom was a, was a rabbi in the temple in Beaumont, Texas, in April 1897. And um, you get just witnesses of impeccable quality describing things that are just very difficult to connect to anything except other airship reports around the world. And I think I'm not even certain that the airship phenomenon, although it was highly strange, is really connected 
with the UFO phenomenon as we understand it. it it's something that's off on its own that is really, really hard to understand. And the deeper you probe into it, the more profoundly puzzling it becomes. Would you suggest that the, the airship phenomena was more terrestrially based then? Does it have an extraterrestrial component to it? Well, I don't, from my point of view, that question doesn't begin to address what we're dealing with. I wouldn't argue that airships are extraterrestrial, but whether they, but terrestrial in what sense? They were terrestrial in the sense that terrestrials had these experiences with airships. Now, what as to the true nature of the airships, we, we can't even speculate. All we know is that it was a phenomenon that was experienced genuinely by people and not just as a joke or as a mistake, but as some very, very strange phenomenon that was experienceable. So you're saying that, that the uh, true phenomena was buried under all the hoaxes and jokes that were played out in the newspaper, especially in the American press. Well, sort of. What I'm saying <laughs> is that this, this was a phenomenon for which it's hard to bring a coherent vocabulary because it, there were airship there was the airship experience, which was an internationally experienced. But as to the nature of the phenomenon being experienced, all we can say is that people described it as airships with human occupants, even though one thing we know for certain is that they, they, were, they were not dirigibles in the United States in... Um, 1896 and 1897, and um, but people were having these experiences with dirigible-like objects. But whether the objects themselves existed in the way we understand that verb is a whole other question. Okay, well, I had not expected this to take the turn it did. Uh, we're going to have to take another break here, the final break, as a matter of fact. I've got a couple of other questions we'll try to get to um, from, from listeners and that sort of thing when we come back to uh, Jerry Clark, the author of the UFO Encyclopedia, Volume 3. And as I always say, take a look at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com because there's always more information that's available at that time. We will be back right after this. here and they've been here for thousands of years making their presence known in the shadows they might be seen by a lonely motorist on a deserted road late at night or by a frightened and confused husband in the bedroom he is sharing with his wife but who are they what do they want why are they here perhaps most concerning has the government been aware of their presence all along the new book by Ellie Marzulli, UFO Disclosure, The 70-Year Cover-Up Exposed, delves into the world of UFOs. Can full disclosure be soon? Order now and receive a free hour and 37-minute DVD on the UFO phenomenon, UFOs Are Real. Get both the book and the DVD, a $40 value, for only $19.99. To order your book and DVD today, go to lamarzuli.net. That's L-A-M-A-R-Z-U-L-L-I.net. Christopher Fulton is a survivor of the National Security State. 
All he wanted to do was preserve history when he acquired a Cartier watch from the estate of President Kennedy's personal secretary. But that simple act set off a terrible chain reaction. He was pursued by the U.S. Justice Department and the FBI, thrust into the middle of the U.S. government's Assassination Records Review Board, even monitored and pursued by the Russian government. All because that Cartier watch was the missing link of evidence, a timepiece worn by JFK that fateful day in Dallas, a link resulting in Christopher being incarcerated and attacked for nine years because he opened a hidden chapter in history. The intriguing journey outlined fully in Christopher Fulton's memoir, The Inheritance, is available now through Trinday.com or Amazon.com. The Inheritance, Poisoned Fruit of JFK's Assassination by Christopher and Michelle Fulton is a must-read, an incredible tale of how easily our own government can overrule justice. The Inheritance, Poisoned Fruit of JFK's Assassination. Once again, I am with Jerry Clark. He, the author of the UFO Encyclopedia, Volume 3. We were talking about the airships. And uh, as I say, I think it took a direction I didn't expect it to take. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask a follow-up question that's probably irrelevant. Um, the uh, crash at Aurora, Texas in April of 1897, because you did bring up Texas in April. So I thought that would be a good transition. I don't know. Maybe not. Uh, what do you think of that, that tale? Well... Uh, it was obviously a hoax. And he, all you have to do is read the news story. The news put it in scare quotes. But I'm just amazed that that thing had resonance, you know, in the in the middle of the 20th century. You know, when it was rediscovered. But it's such a clearly fabulous story, and I mean fabulous as in fable. Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> and I think um, I may have been one of the first people to go investigate that case. And I remember talking to this guy with these gnarled hands, um, I guess from his his uh, arthritis or whatever, telling us that he had been around in 1897 as a little kid and that never happened and that sort of thing. And years later, I saw him on a TV program and said, yeah, I witnessed this thing. <laughs> so there oh, you yeah. go. There you go. Yep. Um, I... Um, one thing I wanted to go to quickly now is um, the influence of John Keel and Jacques Vallée on, I guess, turning ufology from the extraterrestrial idea toward a more high strangest came, claims. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Well, I think that, um, that they were broadly the same. You know, they both challenged the prevailing extraterrestrial hypothesis and um, – Keel did it at full volume. Valet's tones were more measured, but no less dismissive. And um, and Valet was certainly the more intellectually sophisticated. But I think the the effect that was both good and bad. And I think of Valet as more the good guy in this. I think that Keel at heart was just a demonologist and. Frankly, I knew the guy personally, and I, he, he was crazy in, in, in all kinds of ways. He had a very strange personality and uh, just a lot of contempt for his fellow humans, not just his fellow ufologists. And well, I well, can see that in his writings. Let me, let me interrupt. You said he was a demonologist. Yeah. Uh, are you is, being literal in that? Yes, okay. quite literal. In fact, Keel thought, Keel, excuse me, thought of himself as a demonologist and that he thought that the what he called ultra terrestrials were actually demons and he actually got his ideas this is not well known I, as far as I know I'm the only person who's written about this and this also is in the encyclopedia on the entry on Keel Keel's ideas he stole without credit from the late uh, Trevor James Constable who was writing these ideas in little articles in Flying Saucer Review, among other places, basically laying out the story that Keel adapted, and he Keel rarely, if ever, mentions Constable. But Constable was a, a, a devotee of Mead Lane, who founded Borderline Science Sciences Research Association in uh, the mid 1940s in Southern California, and um, that was an occult group that very quickly adapted flying saucers. In fact, it was already talking about air visitors from space and the etheric realm and so on before the Arnold sighting. They were publishing a, a bulletin in the mid-1940s that laid out 
before there were flying saucers, an alternative to the extraterrestrial hypothesis. And Keel ran with that. And Valet dissented from the extraterrestrial hypothesis for good reasons and bad, but he was much more interesting and intellectually careful. So Keel, Keel was not really a ufologist then, even though he wrote a qu great deal about ufology. Yeah, he was... Uh, some people thought of him as the new Fort, but he was actually more like the new Tiffany Thayer. And Thayer was the first major disciple of Fort to help. He helped organize the Fortian Society in 1932, and he edited its publication for as long as the organization lasted, which I think was into the 1950s. But Thayer was just a crackpot. Oh, don't don't sugarcoat it, Jerry. What do you really think? Yeah, no. I mean, uh, <laughs> I, James Blish even wrote a novel around a Tiffany Thayer character. I, um, I, well, before we run out of time here, I just wanted: Are you a you're not a subscriber to the extraterrestrial hypothesis anymore? Or do you have a, a different theory? Oh man. See if I can suppress, express this quickly. I believe that, <laughs> suppress it quickly. Yes, uh, for your error. I I think I have a position that nobody else has. That I think that the extraterrestrial hypothesis, in which I neither believe nor disbelieve, but is a reasonable interpretation of the hardcore evidence, the radar visuals, the CE twos. If you suspect that those are caused by extraterrestrial visitors and you also are paying attention to what astrobiologists are saying about the ubiquitous of intelligent life in the universe, then you've then you've got you know you're you're already th there with a quite reasonable hypothesis it may be right it may be wrong but it's not unreasonable it's hard to imagine what UFOs that show up on radar or leave physical traces suggested of an unearthly technology, it's, it's not unreasonable to think that they could be from an extrasolar region. That's not unreasonable. It could be wrong, but it's not unreasonable. But I think that it is really unreasonable to, to try to integrate that into the really high strangeness phenomena that that we've come to think without really thinking are part of UFOs, abductions, men in black, monsters, all these other things. I think those things are different. I think airships are different from radar visual UFOs. The, 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 the high strangeness phenomena are experiential. We, have, we don't have good reason to believe they're event phenomena. Radar visuals are about event phenomena abductions, men in black, and so on, are experiential phenomena. They can be experienced in some kind of weird liminal space between the imagined and the real, but you're never going to prove their ex existence because they don't exist except to be experienced. Uh, uh, strange concept. I'm trying to wrap my mind around that. Um, you're suggesting that they might be... Um, I guess, induced in some kind of a hallucinatory state or something of that nature? Not hallucinations, as we understand them. As I say, we're dealing with the limitations of vocabulary. We don't really have a vocabulary because we think that we have these, this binary thinking. It happened or it didn't happen. What if it didn't happen and it did happen at the same time? That it happened in some kind of liminal zone, some third kingdom. And um, and we just don't really understand that even if you can have this vivid experience, it doesn't arise from mental disorder or perceptual error, but is quite experiential, quite experienceable and in a very strange way. That's where we're, that's probably where high strangeness UFO phenomena occur. In a, in a state of state of encounter that's both real and unreal at the same time. In in the encyclopedia, there's an entry called Experience Anomalies. And if you want 
an explanation of the concept. It's there. But you're suggesting that abductions may not be extraterrestrial beings involved with it. It may be some other kind of experience. For the most part, there are several abduction stories that strike me as impressive, where you're dealing with multiple witnesses and so on. But most of these have all the resonance of, you know, experiences with other kinds of, in other supernatural contexts. For example, you know, fairy kidnappings. It has that kind of resonance of something that an encounter with the ineffable, ineffable but that we define in our consciousness through our cultural concept of an in, in otherworldly race. If you live in the west of Ireland in the 18th century, you could be kidnapped by fairies. That was a very real experience to some people. And in our time, because our concept of the, of the otherworldly is so tied to the extraterrestrial, if you have that kind of experience, the experience of being taken by otherworldly entities, they're going to appear to you to be space people. Well, we're going to have to leave it there because we're flat out of time. So, uh, Jerry Clark, it's the UFO Encyclopedia Volume 3. You don't have a website, do you? No. <laughs> you don't live in the 20th century, 21st I just, century. No, I think that it's just a natural modesty. I'm, I'm just not interested enough of myself to, to promote myself that way. Okay, well, Jerry, thank you so much for joining us on A Different Perspective. Appreciated the conversation. We'll, thank I'm you sure very we'll talk much, again. Kevin. You're, okay. you're welcome. Thank you. Bye. Uh, once again, that was Jerry Clark, and it's the UFO Encyclopedia, Volume 3. And, and again, uh, take a look at uh, the XZBN.net for some other fine programs on the paranormal. I will have uh, additional commentary, I guess, and some uh, other in information at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. Next week, I will be joined by... Uh, Dan Farkas, who is going to talk to us about hyper-civilization, which is not what I thought it was, but I took a look at his book and was surprised at the direction it took. And we'll have a kind of a different view on um, what UFOs might be or what they might not be. Uh, that'll be next week with uh, Dan Farkas. So in the meantime, have a, good, have a good time out there. And I will be back in 167 hours. If you are looking for a safe, zero-calorie, natural option to the harmful artificial sweeteners on the market today, Just Like Sugar is what you're looking for. Just Like Sugar is a wonderful natural alternative for those health-conscious people who choose a calorie-restricted diet with a great, pure, sweet flavor that tastes just like sugar. Just Like Sugar is a great natural option for people suffering from diabetes and may be useful in restricted diet programs where standard sugars are not allowed and does not cause a laxative effect of some other sweeteners. Just Like Sugar comprises a perfect blend of chicory root fiber, natural calcium, natural vitamin C, and Just Like Sugar sweetness comes from the natural flavors from the peel of the orange. Just Like Sugar is a natural alternative to harmful artificial sweeteners and will change the way that you believe all natural sweetener products taste. Just Like Sugar is available at your local Whole Foods markets, Wild Oats markets, Henry's, Sun Harvest, and many other fine natural food stores in the U.S., Canada, and worldwide. They are here, and they've been here for thousands of years, making their presence known in the shadows. They might be seen by a lonely motorist on a deserted road late at night, or by a frightened and confused husband in the bedroom he is sharing with his wife. But who are they? What do they want? Why are they here? Perhaps most concerning, has the government been aware of their presence all along? The new book by Ellie Marzulli, UFO Disclosure, The 70-Year Cover-Up Exposed, delves into the world of UFOs. Can full disclosure be soon? Order now and receive a free hour and 37-minute DVD on the UFO phenomenon, UFOs Are Real. Get both the book and the DVD, a $40 value, for only $19.99. To order your book and DVD today, go to lamarzuli.net. That's L-A-M-A-R-Z-U-L-L-I dot net. You have heard of the X-Zone? Now watch it on Simo TV. 
plus 500 video games, live TV channels, free video on demand, worldwide, and more. Does this sound like tomorrow's television? Well, it is, but you can have it today, right now. It is Simul TV. Simul TV offers what the others only wish they could provide. 15 exclusive channels like X-Zone, Sci-Fi, and Horror. We are worldwide. No other provider offers that. 500 built-in video games. No need to have an extra expensive system. We have them included. Free video on demand. Live streaming events from around the world. Interactive online network and much more. Tomorrow's TV today. Simul TV. Sound too good to be true? Well, it's not. You can have Simul TV today. Sign up at simultv.com. Do it today.